was done. I want to take a minute and talk about something before I teach. Um, a lot of you are already aware of this is going on, and I actually hate that at this time of year they even need to talk about it, but there's a drag show coming to town, Millersburg, next month. And a lot of you, like I said, you've heard about this, and we're not, we're not real thrilled about this, especially when it first was announced they were going to allow kids as young as 14 to be a part of it. So there have been meetings and prayers and, and things going on about this. And next Wednesday, this, I say next Wednesday, three days, this coming Wednesday, there's a borough meeting. Now, there was talk about doing a meeting at the high school, but it is going to be at the borough meeting. And I'm told there's 46 seats there. That's not very many. Um, we were hoping to have people to be able to get inside and stuff. And they have set rules in place, and they're going to, they've referred to it as lines. Steve Blair I was at a pastor's group on Thursday where a, group, a bigger group of pastors and then five or six of us met Friday morning and the boroughs set in place things like the first line of people that are going to be allowed in are people that are borough residents. Is there anybody here that's an actual borough resident? Two, three, four, we have a few right there. I wasn't sure. But they're the first group of people they're going to allow in are borough residents. Obviously with 46 people, that's not a lot. Uh, the second group are borough business owners and then upper Paxton Township people. And I'm not sure if they split people, you know, residents as opposed to work uh, business owners, but I know it's upper Paxton Township. And if there are any seats left, anybody outside of that could go in. Uh, I don't expect it's going to get that far. Um, but I did learn just as, this morning, um, Cheryl told me that there are going to be people that are there just singing, worshiping the Lord. Um, so if you do go to this and, and you can't get a seat, there will be something there to do um, and just join. Um, we are, you know, a little word to the wise out there. So we're speaking about wisdom today. Um, there's a scripture in the Bible, and I, it's in the King James, and I always forget exactly where it's at. It says something like, I don't like King James always, but a wise man shutteth his lips. <laughs> there are times that we don't do you know use our mouths to talk and and if there are people there that are from the there's talk of people being bussed in um that are supporters of the drag show um there's talk of news people being here we're not sure we'll see we won't know till wednesday night what actually happens but we're just saying if you are engaged in any ways you don't have to respond you know if it, uh, the people in the press unfortunately today look for ways to make believers look bad it's kind of a sad Sad thing, um, but I have a pastor friend down in Camp Hill who's interviewed for two hours by CBS, Harrisburg CBS News 21, I think it is, and they literally took one sentence that he said, and out of the whole thing that he said, and it didn't sound good because of what they took out, the way they, the way they plugged it in there. Two hours, and he thought it went extremely well, but they took, every, they went into one thing he said and pulled it out. And so you just, we just have to be very careful. And if there are people there that are trying to antagonize or, you know, just cause, you know, stir things up, um, just, we're just saying, just be silent. You don't need to respond. You can smile, you know, but they, there's no reason to get into wars and stuff and, you know, battles over this. And, you know, one thing that's come out of this that's very interesting is Steve Blair, the pastor of Hillside down, half their building is in the borough. <laughs> And half their building is in Upper Paxton Township. So Steve is actually going to be the one speaking on behalf of churches and, and Christians in the area. He's got seven minutes. The, we, we're not sure, but we think the spokesperson for the show is going to be the owner of the Peace of, Peace of Mind Cafe, which is where the show is going to be taking place. It's not her show. She's basically letting them use the place. Um, she got into this. I think if, it, if she could get out of it now, she probably would, but she can't. Um, she's under contract and could be sued. And... Um, we're not expecting the borough to vote and say they can't do this thing. Um, we're just hoping mainly that they say that 18 and older, which Crystal was saying that, but we don't know. And they're saying you know, things are going to be whatever. But anyway, they're going to get seven minutes to talk, and Steve's going to get seven minutes to talk. And then people that are inside will get two minutes to say something up to so many, you know, with only 46 people there. Uh, it's not really that much. And... Um, but just, we're just encouraging you to pray and show support. Um, but I started to say that one of the cool things that happened is Steve actually got a chance to go in and talk to Crystal. 
And a couple things happened out of that conversation. Number one, he got to pray with her, um, share the gospel with her. She teared up. She didn't, you know, because he wanted her to understand where we're coming from. He did. He just went in in just such an incredible way, loving, kind, found out that there are Christians that are bashing her. One cussed her out. Did you hear what I just said? That, that's not, that's not godly. If you, if there's anger to be pointed, it's at the principalities and powers in the air that want to come in and steal our kids and steal this area and, and people, but it's not aimed at the owner or even the people that are coming in to do the show. Yeah, it's, it stinks that they're coming, and, and anger is justified only in that spiritual realm where we're going in and after what's really behind all this. Um, but Steve apologized to her for those things that were said to her, and I was glad he did that on behalf of churches because nobody should be dealing with that. That's just wrong. That's not Christ. It's not what he did. And Steve went in in just a great way, but he was able to share very clearly where we're coming from, that we're not coming to you in hate, in anger. We're coming because this goes totally against what we believe. And there's video, apparently, of a show that these guys did in town um, that is just horrible, absolutely um, hypersexual, just nothing healthy about it, nothing good. And we just want to pray, and we don't want this here. And um, so just... Please, if you get a chance, and you're going to be handed a paper on your way out the doors after church, which uh, what time the show is and everything, and if you can join, please do. I, I may get a chance to sit inside, even though I'm not a borough resident. Uh, apparently, there's five seats that each side is going to be able to have, and, and I, I'm avail- I made myself available. I, won't, I may not know till Wednesday. I don't know yet. I don't know who those five people will get to sit in there. If they have to be borough residents, that's what Steve will find out, and probably maybe Monday or Tuesday, hopefully, he'll be able to find that out. Um, but we just uh, we want to go in here and, and just do this right and, and pray and, and trust the Lord that this stuff's just not going to come in. And, and it just, you know, pray that just no one shows up, no one goes to it, no one, you know, that it just dies. And because and, we don't really feel like, we don't really feel like, as a whole, this, the valley here, this is something that we're looking for. There are groups of people, smaller groups of people, that this is what they want. But as a whole, we don't see that. Um, but yet, it's still creeping in, little by little. And it's getting normalized and trying to get normalized. And we don't want it to be normal. And, it, you know, even, like, I, I think I said this already one Sunday. Um, there are churches that, you know, are even accepting you know, for some reason, feeling like accepting these lifestyles is what we should be doing, and that's not our responsibility. We know God did put things in place the way he did, and that's what we, that's what we believe in, and we're not changing for that purpose. And so anyway, I, I, like I said, I hate to have to bring that up um, at this time of year, but it's something that's coming. It's here. You, you, just like we talked about in York for a lot of times, have been very protected from a lot of things. And I'm sure you feel that way here, but it's these things are coming in and creeping their way in and, and, and wanting to do parades and different things like that. And it's just not it's just not healthy and it's not godly and and we are not interested in it. So um, please. Uh, this is not light. This is not a light, light thing at all. It's 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 getting the enemy is getting more bold. People are getting more bold in what they're doing. And they don't really care what we think, but <clears throat> excuse me, but um, that's we need to care. <laughs> we need to care for lost people who that this stuff can affect and impact in a negative way. And so be praying for people to to um, just not go to this, that it dies and shuts down, whatever. And um, we'll see what happens after that. OK, so. Is there anything else, do you guys, I know you two have got a lot. Do you, is there anything else that's going on? The only thing that we know is that, uh, or that we have heard that is, as people speak and they're allowed that two minutes, they will be asked to leave and other people will be able to come in. I was told yesterday morning that's not the case, but I don't know. Yeah, we did, and it might. I heard, we did hear that too. That's possible. Because there is a lot of time that, the lot of time is more than, 40-something, and it wouldn't, if there's 46 people in it, that even includes the ones who already get to speak. 
it's like two and a half hours. And if you do two minutes and divide it into two and a half hours, it's more than what you're getting in that room. So maybe, maybe they are going to, so we'll see. That's, we, we're not sure. So it wouldn't be bad to be around just in case that is a possibility. So, all right. All right, well, let's get into this. We're going to go into Matthew chapter 2. You heard a little bit about the wise men already. Larry started talking. You could have talked about the gifts. I'm not taking time on the gifts. Uh, the actual, to explain what the gifts were, I want to talk about just who, a little bit about, we don't know much. You know, we get this little write-up about this group of people that came. Uh, we don't know how many there were. We assume three because there were three gifts. So that's why you always see three wise men, you know, at the stable, which, by the way, they actually never were at the stable. And um, they, they came later. We, we don't know how much later. We just know that Herod, when he sent out the decree to kill the babies later after this passage I'm going to read, he said to kill the babies two years and younger. So Herod did the math and figured out, you know, here, probably this old, and let's go a little bit past that to be safe. So it was a little bit sometime after Jesus was born. Um, but anyway, Matthew chapter 2, today's message is just simply wise men still seek him. Wise men still seek him. So Matthew chapter 2, the verse 12 verses. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I may go and worship him too. All right. After this, Jesus, the, after this interview, the wise men went away, went their way, and they, the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So there's a lot in there, and obviously we're hearing about these men that traveled from the east, and I'm going to go out of order of my notes here because I want to talk a little bit about them. We, one thing we know, they came from the east, most likely Persia, which is today known as Iran. Um, this means that they traveled eight or 900, up to 900 miles possibly to see, following this star, to see this baby that was born, this king of the Jews. And, you know, we wonder, well, how did they even know? You know, there's the only thing that we can look at it. There are writings of Daniel. We know that Daniel was in Persia. We know that, you know, so in, in Daniel chapter 9, I'm not reading these verses, but there's the 70-week prophecy, which is an incredible thing, which we, most people believe the 69 weeks of those 70 weeks have been fulfilled, and there's one week left, which would be the Great Tribulation. Um, but he gives a timeline for the birth of Messiah. Um, and also the Magi may have been aware of the prophecy of Balaam. You all remember who Balaam was? He's the guy whose donkey talked to him. I don't have that scripture. I should have pulled it up because it's kind of interesting. Can you imagine doing something and you go try to go and the donkey wouldn't go? There was an angel trying to stop him. Balaam didn't see him, but the donkey did. And Balaam kept beating his donkey. And finally, the donkey started talking, which would be kind of freaky. Um, but but Balaam, Balaam actually prophesied that, this, that there would be a star coming out of Jacob. And so there were, we have to assume that somehow these men, they're, they're referred to as wise men, um, that they knew and were familiar with at least some scripture. We don't know how, you know, little, much, you know, the Jews were, had been scattered abroad at different times in captivity. Um, could have been the, you know, the Babylonian captivity, the different things we don't, and like I said, Daniel, you know, they could have read Daniel's writings. Um, so it, we, we're not sure exactly, but we know that they came from the East and it was probably quite a distance. Um, but they were guided to look for the king of the Jews. 
by a miraculous stellar event. Now, interesting, in that passage I read, three different groups of people there. They have the wise men. The wise men, what did they want to do? They wanted to find this king so that they could worship him. And then Herod, what did he want to do? You don't read about it right in that passage, but most of us are familiar with what happens next. And I already said it and mentioned it. He wanted to kill him. And then there are the religious leaders who are brought in because they're like, where is, you know, where is he supposed to be born? Now, I don't know what happened. They followed this star so far, and I don't know if the star disappeared for a bit because then it showed up towards the end and said they followed the star to Bethlehem. Why didn't they just follow the star to Bethlehem? These are questions I get when I read the Bible. Why didn't they just follow the star to Bethlehem? Why did they have to stop in Jerusalem and say, where is the king of the Jews? We came to worship him. I don't, I don't know. I, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I don't. But they asked, and so they bring the religious leaders in, and the religi religious leaders we find basically, other than giving the information he's going to be born in, Jer in uh, Bethlehem, are pretty indifferent, and, and we don't read anything about that they did anything. So we, the wise men wanted to worship him, which the wise men still seek him. You know, being wise is still important today. Herod wanted to kill him, and the religious leaders pretty much did nothing. So it's interesting out of that grouping. So... Like I said, they came to Jerusalem, asked about the birth of Christ, and they were directed to Bethlehem. And they followed God's guidance joyfully. We read in Matthew chapter 10, they were happy when they were doing this. Um, they gave costly gifts to Jesus, and they worshiped him. When they found him, they were excited. They found him. They, and imagine in journeying eight or 900 miles for us, many of you have driven that. I don't know if you've done it in a day. I've driven probably close to 1,000 miles in a day already. Uh, once, I think I did that one time, probably never again, but that's in a car one day. I, I never didn't look up to see how long does it take if you're traveling by camel, which we don't even know they were on camels. We don't know. How long did it take them? How long was this star seen before they actually got where they were going? Eight or 900 miles. I don't know how long it would take to walk that, be on a donkey or be on a camel, but a lot longer than driving a car or taking a train or flying. We know that. So these guys were invested they were, there was something that they knew that this was a really, really important event that was happening that was going to change the world. Where wise, you know, some people refer to him as kings. Basically, in scripture, we just get this wise men. And came to look for the king of the Jews. We don't know. They could have been Jewish for all, you know, there's a possibility they were Jews from being scattered back in the day. We don't really know. We just know that they were referred to as wise men. And one of the things that makes them wise is they were looking for Jesus, seeking Jesus, and wanted to worship him and did worship him. God warned them about it in a dream, you know, against returning to Herod. Uh, so in defiance of the king, they left Judea by another route. So the Magi were men. There's just four, five quick things here. I'm not teaching on it. I'm just saying what it basically. They read, heard, and believed, you know, they read or heard. You know, a lot of people, we think about, you know, they read. They, they didn't have a, uh, the average house, well, they didn't have one of these in them. We know that. They didn't have a Bible in it. Everything was on scrolls back in those days, and most people probably didn't have scrolls in their house. So maybe they heard somehow in the hearing uh, uh, hearing God's word, reading it, they believed God's word, that this star was going to guide them. Now, I'm still amazed by the fact that there was a star. I love stars. I love looking at the sky. I love going places. You know, one of the things um, in Maine where the guys go bear hunting, I went up a couple years ago, and I went to college in Maine, and I remember I used to lay out on the lawn. I stayed up one summer, and I would just look. And when you get into places where it's blacker, <laughs> you darker at night. The sky's more brilliant. And when you get to a place like Maine, there's not a lot of cities. It's just dark. And where I went to school, we were 45 minutes northwest of Bangor. There was nothing out there. There were no bright lights, no stadiums, no nothing. And the sky was brilliant. And some nights were even blessed enough to see the northern lights, the pinks and the blues, just that, you know, the, the, what are the, the reflection of the ocean and that just the rippling. And I, I'm in fact, I just love it. I think it's amazing. And yet, so there was a star that guided them. I mean, we see stars, but we never think about them guiding us. We don't think about them leading us anywhere. These guys read about this, see this, what had to be an incredible star, and followed it maybe eight or 900 miles. So they read, the number one, they read, believe God's word. Number two, they sought Jesus. Number three, they recognized the worth of Christ. 
Number four, they, as wise, probably influential men, humbled themselves to worship Jesus. And five, they obeyed God rather than man when they didn't go back to see Herod. So that's pretty incredible. Um, just thinking about who they were and, and what they had to go through to get to where he was to worship him, to worship the king of the Jews, Jesus Christ, the one who came to bridge the gap, right? I mean, this is what we're getting ready to celebrate. When Adam and Eve sinned, you know, the enemy, the devil had, came, was in a sense given the birthright, given the title deed to the earth. And, and we read all through the Old Testament about what people had to do to have their sins forgiven and the, the, the sacrificial system. And, you know, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. You know, so there was always the sacrifice. And, and that's one of the things that I struggle with today a little bit when, you know, from the Jewish perspective is you don't see the sacrifices. And I want to, if I could talk to somebody, like if I could go to one of the synagogues or something and say, what, what about the scripture that says without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins? Where, where is that happening now in your life if you don't believe in Jesus? Um, so anyway, Jesus now came to earth. God came, in a sense, invaded earth. Jesus came in the form of man, Jesus, to live a life without sin that Adam didn't do, couldn't do, and then ultimately died on the cross, which we, we know every Easter we, we, we celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection. But he came to live a life without sin and to die ultimately so that we didn't have to die an eternal death. You know, Larry mentioned the celebration of life yesterday, and it was beautiful, Marlon Henninger. Um, and you sit there and know that there's, it's so awesome when you, at, at, at a funeral service, you just know that the person, when they closed their eyes for the last time, as Ed shared in his message, um, that when he closed his eyes for the last, you know, that last time here on earth, that, he, that they were open, as they opened immediately, he was in the presence of Jesus in heaven, you know. That's a, that's a beautiful thing, but that would have never happened had God not come to earth. He was the only one who could do it, and he came as a man. And just like Adam, the ability to sin was there. He could have chosen when the devil tempted him. He could have taken and given into the temptation. Had he not been able to give in to it, then it was, not, then it was just a show, and that's not, that's not what it was. It was real. He came to earth to save us and to gap you know, Adam and Eve had the ability to, to communicate with God, direct communication. There was no sacrificial system. They, there was no, at that time, not even a, a place to repent because there was no sin. But once they did sin, things had to be put in place. But when Jesus comes and he did what he did for us, we now can have this relationship with the Father yeah, because we're still in this body and we still have the flesh wars against the spirit and it wants its way and is selfish and sometimes we give into that. There's, we do need to still repent as believers, not for not to be born again again, but just, you know, just be clean and to cleanse the dust that we pick up as we walk on this journey of this earth and, and pick up things even sometimes without trying. You know, there's just, you just pick it up, being around crowds and people and music in different areas. Sometimes we just pick it up. But he came so that now we get to live and we get this direct line of communication where at any time we have the ability to go into the presence of God. Any time, in your home, in your car, at the office, on the job, on your farm, <laughs> out in your yard, on your walks up the, on the mountain, when you're sitting on a deer stand, you have this ability to just immediately enter the presence of God, and we carry the presence of God. So it's not like we have to go somewhere to get there. It's already with us. It's just immediate, have this access to talk to him and then listen to him and hear what he has to say to me. That's, that's what we got. And that's where we have to remember wise men, wise women still seek him because that's why we do it, because we have access, we have this relationship. Every one of us, has this God-shaped vacuum inside of us. And if it's not filled by God, it's going to be filled with something else. And unfortunately, when it gets filled with something else, it's distorted and warped, and that's why we have things like drag shows and things that get out of hand. That's why we have people that get addicted to drugs and, and, and alcohol and, I'm, and, and, and pornography and, and different ways 
that this and food and different things that we get. We have these things that bring us temporary peace. There's no real peace in it, but it brings temporary peace. I was listening to a, a podcast yesterday. It's actually the guys who, um, what were the duck? What was it? Duck Dynasty. Um, Phil Robertson and his son Jace, and I forget the other son's name. They had a guy come in who does some counseling. He lived down that area from where he lives, and, and and he started even talking about food, and how when people, uh, a young, he was talking about himself when he was in school. He was bullied. Now, if you saw him now. And not unusual for someone who's bullied as a boy to someday get into gym and bulk up and get big so he's not bullied anymore. That's, he's past doing it for that purpose, but that happens. But he talked about how, you know, after being bullied at school, he'd go home and eat a honey bun, and the honey bun made him feel better. Now, it sounds a little weird, but sugar, it, it does something, and it brought a little peace. And then the next time, two honey buns, and the next time, eventually eating the whole box of honey buns, and he talked a little bit about how the, psycho the psychology of we humans, we do things because we're looking for peace. And though it's not real peace, we do it. So this God-shaped vacuum, if it's not filled with God, that space that's inside, that, that spirit that was meant and to, be in, to be in unity with Christ, to be, uh, to be in communion <laughs> with him, and to have him living and dwelling on the inside of us, when we don't fill it with him, it, it's warped. So that's, that's, that's why we, when we pray, we pray for people that their God-sized vacuum will be filled with him and that they would learn and have this experience with him. I mean, we have radical, even in religion, you have it, where people find their peace in, in a religion, these Muslim extremists. You know, when you see the, the Hamas and these different things that are going on in the world today, they're trying to fill the void that's not been filled by Jesus Christ. And they're doing it in the name of God. Now, they'll say Allah, the Muslims, but in their, the name of God, they'll say they're doing these things. So it's so critical for us to be filled with the Spirit of God continually. As you read through the book of Acts, it tells us all the time they were filled again with the Spirit of God. And they, they, were, they were constantly being refilled because as this life goes on, we fill ourselves up with the Lord. And as, as we do what we were singing in the songs about today, be in the light that we go out and shine our light, well, our batteries inside get run down a little bit as we're shining our light. We're like a sponge. We go in and we read the word and we pray and we worship and we get filled up. And then we go out in this life and in a sense, we wring ourselves out. We wring ourselves out on people. <laughs> through love, through kindness, you know, demonstrating through sharing Christ and being Christ's ambassadors in this world and being his representatives. And, then it, and, and some of us, unfortunately, are living in that place where we're wrung out or our batteries are dead and we're not recharging and we're not filling that sponge back up with water, which is what it was made for. It wasn't made to be dry and sitting on a sink. It was made to be, you know, used to do something. So those are things we have to do. We have to continually fill ourselves up. It's not a one and done. Constant filling yourself with the Lord, giving it away. And he promises when he gives it away that he gives us not just what we gave away. He gives us more. And that's what's so beautiful about that. And this is, what, this, is, this is when we're filled with wisdom. You know, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We know that from Proverbs. And, and when, when, not fear where we're just afraid, but this understanding of who he is and filling ourselves up with him is just such an important thing. But let me short quickly, and I, I tried to give a short message because I knew the kids were doing their thing today, but I have four things that I'm going to quickly go through about as wise people today, what we would do, you know, just to think about. So wise people today seek Christ to worship him just as the original wise men did. Okay, their purpose is coming. Their purpose of the wise men that we read about was forthright that we have come to worship him. They weren't embarrassed. They weren't ashamed. They didn't care. They probably didn't think about the fact that when they said to Herod, we came to worship him, that that king who was insecure because he wasn't his his God sized vacuum wasn't filled with Jesus or God. He didn't know that Jesus yet the Christ at that time. They didn't have the experience of the relationship with God. So they, they didn't think about him being insecure and wanting to kill the king because he's a threat to his, his throne. You know, they didn't think about that. They were just, we come to worship. And in worship, 
Think about this. We, as we worship today, and even they did, we declare our allegiance as we allegiance. <coughs> excuse me. We declare our allegiance as we celebrate his supremacy and worth, his sovereignty, his kingship, and his worth. In worship, we recognize the great one in our own ready, in our own neediness, regardless of our position in life. See that when we bow down and worship him, we're saying we can't do it ourselves. We need you. He alone is ultimately wise. Romans 16, 27, and you can pop that one up. It says, to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. I saw something yesterday, and I don't, I'm not going to get it perfect, but it was, I'm going to be close, that all religions try to take you and point you to God. But you know the difference in our, I don't like the word religion a whole lot, but in our belief system, in our Bible, we learn that our God came to us to reveal himself to us. That's the difference. All other religions are trying to show you, and unfortunately, interesting, and, and I don't remember, Jace, I, I was just going to say I didn't remember his name, and then it popped in my head, Jay Smith, I think it was, that the guy that came that's, yeah, he stood up here and he actually said they've actually got to the point where they're not even sure Muhammad ever even lived, that there is such a thing as a Muhammad. I thought that was interesting, and that goes back a couple years when he was here. Um, but people have bought into that, and, and that's what they're taught, and that's what they believe. But everything in those religions is trying to take and lead you to their God, where our God came to us to reveal himself to us. He came looking for you, and he came looking for me. It's pretty cool. So, hey, so wise people seek to worship him just as the original wise men. Second, wise people today seek Christ to build their lives on the solid foundation of his teaching and the remainder of the Bible. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, um, Jesus concludes with an illustration contrasting, contrasting two builders, those who built their house or their life, think about life, that's what it was picturing, on a rock, and those who built their house on sand. And that was a big difference. So built their, Matthew 7, 24 says, everyone... Then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The others whom he deems foolish heard but did not obey. And Matthew 20, what, two verses later, Matthew 7, 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And uh, there's a lot of you in this building that are familiar with constructing you know, doing construction and building and everything. And if you build a house on sand and uh, try to build a sand castle, you know, what happens as soon as the water comes in? It gets washed away. And if you build on the sand, even with concrete and, and brick and block or anything like that, if it's nothing underneath to support it, it's, gonna, it's, just gonna, it's not going to last. So we need to be wise, hear the words, listen to them and do them. That's what wise people still do today. The wise men seek to learn Jesus what Jesus teaches, and live by that teaching. That's what we want to do. Number three, wise people today are very careful about how they live. This is important for everyone, how we live our lives. You know, and, I, and this is why I even said even coming in contact with people when things are happening like this show that's happening, that for a Christian to walk into a business and cuss out a non-believer what kind of testimony is that? Now, I'm not saying you don't have a right to talk and say I'm really disappointed, um, I don't feel like I can come to your establishment anymore and support you because my moral compass doesn't allow me to do that. But see, you can do that in a way that still ha is not mean and angry. You can still write a letter and e express your displeasure in what they're doing and, and feel the need that you can't come there. That's okay. That's fine. But to walk in and cuss a person out and to do something, and, and I don't know the other things that were said, but it was pretty bad. And when Steve looked at her and said, on behalf of Christians, I apologize to you. I'm very sorry this happened. She cried. Three different times in his conversation, she teared up as she heard the message of Christ, as she heard him asking forgiveness. And I forget the third one, but it's just uh, being Christ-like, and Steve did an amazing job doing that. But anyway, we're careful how we live. The Apostle Paul speaks to those who seek Christ for wisdom. In Ephesians 5.15, he said, Paul called us to be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. How do we learn about being wise? We read the scriptures. 
there's one book that's all about wisdom, and it's called Proverbs. You know, and, and there's something too, and I don't know if any of you do that, read a proverb a day. You know, 30 days, you know, February, you have to, you know, read two more, maybe on the 28th, and some days you get a day off when you have 31 days. So, but there's just wisdom that just oozes from this Bible, and we do well to learn that, so it's important. And then let me read Deuteronomy um, 8, verses 1 to 3. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be very careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that our Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing to you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You know, man is an interesting thing, and it's something that, that we have to think about in a sense that it's there for us. The manna from heaven is still there for us. and not the bread, the whatever it was that they woke up to and picked up, but when we seek the Lord, he feeds us. That's, he nourishes us. He gives us what we need. He fills that void. He continually fills it, refills it, and, and strengthens it and matures it and, and continuing. And, and, and even these people that walk through their wildernesses, we walk through these on our, in our day. We don't have 40 years that we wander, um, but we have this life that we wander through. You know, and we go through things, and we celebrated a life of a man yesterday, but yet there's sadness because the family and friends walk through a wilderness. You know, it's, it's and, and when your father dies, it, it only happens once. You can't say, well, I don't know, I know what to do. I've, ha- I've had this happen. You know, when I've driven to York many times, and later today soon I have to drive to York. I don't have to think about it. I know the route to go. I know what to, where to go. And they said 83 South Bridge was closed, so I had to make plans to go a different way. But now I heard it's fixed and it's already done. So I'm glad. But anyway, we know the way to go. But when our dad dies, we don't know. When our mom passes, when things happen like that, we're not sure how to, how to navigate that always. You know, so we go through things and God teaches us and, and brings us to these places. And that's not from a humbling standpoint, as we read there in that passage of Deuteronomy. But there is this, this part where we have to rely and depend on him or we're lost. And we're doomed to an eternity without God. And I don't know why anybody would be interested in that. I don't know. But this thing I do know, and I'm wrapping up here, is wise men know that Jesus is the answer to the sin problem in the world today. Wise men recognize the importance of the relationship between themselves and the Lord. And they also seek Jesus for their lost and unsaved friends and family and neighbors and community. We still do that. We should still be doing that. Wisdom cries out in the street these things to worship the Lord, to hear his word and take heed to it and obey it. That's words for us for today. Our our message, in a sense, going into Christmas, and I haven't said these, and I was remiss in not saying it, is just going into this simply Jesus, just getting back to the basics the fundamentals. It's just, it all goes back to him. And we celebrate him being born as a baby. But he didn't come just to be born and, you know, babies are so cute and cuddly and I love babies. I think they're one of the most fascinating things that happen in the earth is a baby. You know, we see deer in the woods the day they're born, they can stand up and walk. A buffalo has a baby and the same day that baby buffalo gets up and walks. Our babies. Our youngest, well, no, it's not our youngest grandchild anymore. Our second youngest grandchild is nine months and doesn't walk yet. You sit there and think, what's wrong with you? The deer walked the first day. It's nine months old. You should be walking. They, it's, God made people different. <laughs> and anyway, that's Stan. I, I, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I love babies. And, but we just, just don't stop at the fact that Jesus was born and get excited and give presents next week and then move on and go back to spinning your wheels and plates the way we do. Let's get back. Let's, let's get to the point where 
We're worshiping him and we're doing what he tells us to do in his word and as he speaks to us. Because some of you he's going to speak to and give you some directions in what you do for life, where you're headed, what you're going to do with some of you younger people. You know, what's God, what are you going to, you can sit and make all the plans you want. But if you give your life to God, he's going to come in and he's going to guide you and he's going to lead you and going to take you where you need to go. So wise children seek the Lord too. We need to raise our children to be seeking the Lord. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, in the midst of busyness, and this week it's getting close. Christmas Day is getting close. Families are going to be coming. To, we'll have people traveling, people coming to us, all kinds of things. And I first off pray for safety as, as everyone in this room, that whether they're traveling or their family's coming, pray for safety of family members going and coming and um, just keep and protect everyone. But Lord, as this all happens, I pray that we don't forget that it's just simply about you. Jesus, this everything in our lives should revolve around you. In our giving, in our receiving, in our time, in our families, it has to all be about you. So I pray, Lord, you fill us up, that you rebaptize us and baptize us with fire, not not redo it, but just continually keep that fire lit within us so that we're full of who you are and that light shines out from that fire that you give us and it just causes people to know who you are, to get curious and to ask. And I pray, Lord, as, as family members, there are going to be people that aren't, that aren't ser- following you, that aren't serving you, that aren't walking with you. And I pray that you open doors, Lord, for, for everyone in this room to have opportunities to share your, our personal story with them. That you open that door and then you open our mouths when the door is open, Lord. And then open the heart to receive what we share. And that's that you love us and you love them. And you died for them. You were born, lived in this world, died for us so that we didn't have to die an eternal death. I pray, Lord, did you give everyone in this room an opportunity to share that story this Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Stay dry. And we'll see you on Christmas Day, if not before. Or Christmas Eve.